This show is sponsored by you, the listener. Stick around until after the news to hear more about that. This is Cup of Go for June 7, 2024. Keep up to date with the important happenings in the Go community in about 15 minutes per week. I'm Jonathan Hall. And I'm Shai Nechmad, and I'm really hoping nothing important in the Go community is going to happen between the 6th and the 7th, because yeah. we're actually recording this uh, on the 6th. Recording a day early, because I'm traveling, I'm in a different time zone right now. And a different mic. And a different I, mic. I, I catch that all the time in other podcasts, where yeah. people switch up their setup, and I'm like, that's not your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a podcast that you listen to for long enough that you recognize, you know? The sounds in the room and whatever. Some, yeah, there's a few that, especially if they do a live uh, recording, you know, on location somewhere, it's very different sound. What's your number one podcast? This is not a show. We're gonna get into. There's super interesting news. What, what What's your number one podcast? Just ours? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've actually mixed it up a lot lately. The one I'm listening to right now is called Your First Million, and it's about a couple. It's a couple of uh, entrepreneurs talking about and interviewing other entrepreneurs who make money. Cool. Your first million. That's such an American uh, sounding show. It sounds show. a lot more egotistical than I think it really is. It's actually kind of a cool show. It, it sounds really like a like, uh, startup bro type thing. And I, don't think, I don't think it really yeah. is. Anyway, let's cool. talk about Go. Yeah, let's get into Go. So last week we mentioned that Go 122.4 and 121.11 were about to be released. They have been. So uh, this included two uh, security fixes. The first one was mishandling of corrupt central directory record in zip files. Uh, so if you're using zip files, uh, be sure to upgrade. And the other is related to net, net IP, unexpected behavior from the is method. Is that right? Is that is or LS? <laughs> font doesn't tell me the difference uh, for IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So if you use IP addresses or zip or files, zip files. <laughs> then you should be upgrading. Sounds like you do. Uh, I know of a of a tool that uses a zip as a de- Go dependency, uh, the GitHub uh, CLI, because the oh, bug yeah. I fixed was in zip files. Oh, so really? I don't know. Maybe we should really. I really was on top of upgrading the CLI when my version came out, and ever since then, every time I run GH in the the command line, it's like, oh, up, upgrade with Bruin. Like, no, I don't think I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I might. But yeah, you know, new security releases, always good to upgrade. You should stay on the latest patch always, right? But there's no reason to not upgrade patches in uh, Go. Miners is you need to worry about a little bit, right? When you upgrade yeah, from, yeah, right. like the latest upgrade uh, broke the init uh, imports and whatever. Uh, but also edge cases, right? It's pretty stable. It's a pretty stable language. It is. But you don't need us to remind, like, convince you that, uh, oh, zip file, I need to check if I have zip file. Just upgrade. You're, nothing yeah. bad's going to happen. It's like arguments with my kid. Like, give it up. But I don't, I'm not using it right now. So what does it matter? Just give it up. <laughs> <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about a couple of proposals. Yeah. So for a future, you know, patch release that includes a security fix, although this might be, uh, this, uh, you know, something that will wait for a minor version. Uh, there's a proposal here from Neil, uh, Damien Neil, to ha- add some safer file open functions to OS. You know, there's a big class of vulnerabilities around files. I think the most common one is uh, you want to serve files from your HTTP server, uh, and then someone asks for the dot dot backslash dot dot backslash dot dot backslash dot dot backslash passwords cat file, <laughs> and your uh, etc password. I mean. And, you know, you travel outside the intended location that you wanted to serve the files from. Uh, this is called directory traversal. And if you're uh, into security or want to get started, just find any place that lets you download files and start typing these uh, paths. One of them is going to work. Uh, I promise that. To try and, uh, you know, circumvent these cases, there's a proposal here for new functions in the OS uh, package, which just... On the surface, I'm I'm starting with a minus 100 points. Like, I don't mm-hmm. like yeah. expanding even more the, the OS library. It seems to me like it's pretty complete. And any other functionality you want to add above it or, you know, alongside it or inside it should be in a, in a different package. Because you want to keep it, like, small. And the reason to 
to opt for these functions because operating systems offer them, right? So the always package basically wants to provide an interface that allows you to interact with, you know, Win uh, API or, you know, modern Linux uh, functions. And there is. You don't only have open to open a file descriptor in Linux. You have open at. And if you're, if you're familiar with Win API, anti-create file has root directory just to prevent these specific cases, right? So the operating systems offer these functionalities. Uh, and this proposal, you know, is just for, hey, let's expose it in the Go library as well. Uh, this is really, really well uh, documented and people seem to, like the proposal is really well written and people seem to like it. Even though I started uh, minus 100 points, I ended up deciding to upvote it as well. <laughs> It is important to note that you don't have to wait for this proposal. If this sounds like something super relevant to code you're writing right now, uh, there is Safe Open. It's like a package yeah. uh, from Google, just called uh, Safe Open, that has like open beneath. And you basically say, only open files that are beneath this path. And then it's uh, e- like immune to directory traversal, you know, vulner- like exploitations, I should say. Um, I'm wondering what you what do you make of this? Like, should we do stuff like this if it's that justified? Like, OS supports it. It's for security. Yeah, I do think it's justified. I also agree with your sort of knee jerk reaction that you why do we need to add more variant to the standard library? But I think this is justified. The thing that's killing me is all right. Uh, someone's going to do open, and then someone's going to OS open. They've written go like five years, and they try to open a file. Then someone. Like, oh, no, it's uh, open in now. Like, Mm -hmm. why would you change it? Uh, Even if it's justified, it feels like a frustrating transitionary period, right? Definitely. And and I don't don't think we're going to be in a place where we can, like, deprecate with GoVet, for example, the old ones, because they're still definitely relevant for certain certain cases. So it's not nearly as clear cut as just stop using the old one and use the new ones now, which is going to kind of be unfortunate, but that's reality. Yeah, and and by the way, it's not like operating systems offer everything out of the box. Like Windows, for I think for delete file, does not have a delete file at or delete file beneath. So it is going to have to be a pure Go implementation using the uh, you know other capabilities that the operating system uh, or you know Windows file system API uh, exposes today. And you know, I ended up being on sure. Let's go ahead with this. But I really hope that the documentation is going to be great and the errors are going to be really, really good. You know, and the error text is going to be very specific and there are going to be different error types for, you know, traversal attempted and root directory access attempted. And what happens if you pass in a a symbolic link that actually points to the uh, open in? Should it work or shouldn't it work? Like every time you touch file systems, it looks simple on the surface. Oh, if it's in the directory, no problem. But when you actually get into it, you can either go with whatever the person who wrote the C function in the Linux uh, you know, kernel decided, that's the truth, or try to make sense. Uh, sometimes these line up, sometimes they don't. But it's another uh, case of someone taking a really, really good package. In this case, it's Google Safe Open and offering it in the standard library. And I think there's a big difference between what I did uh, a few months ago where I said, let's take a really good package called YAML and suggest it in the standard library, which is a huge dependency, really big and doesn't really have justification other than, you know, maybe if we offer JSON, why why not YAML? Where, you know, there's a ton of real world examples of people accidentally using open file uh, and exposing themselves to directory traversal. But it's going to be a tricky uh proposal and it's going to be a tricky implementation i think if you're into like operating systems uh, and i don't know files and security this is something you should really jump on both the discussion and the implementation and it's still like open right now it's still active so you know it's it's all open i'm not, I'm not sure uh, how the team even uh, feels about this one other than adding it to the active column which is a good sign mm-hmm. uh, so link in the show notes if you want to dive into it so if that one wasn't uh, full of enough uh, nuance let's talk about another proposal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one's technical, but I, I think it's interesting as well. Yeah, so the uh, you, you may recall that uh, presumably in Go 123, unless something drastic happens, they have to revert it. We're going to have the ability to range over functions. So you can create a, a function with a certain signature that, that can be fed into a for loop, a for range loop, 
to iterate over the return values of this function. And so there's a new proposal. How, how shall we say? I think it, like categorizing it as a new proposal is not as relevant as just as imagine someone in your uh, work Slack. There's there's a channel called Big Refactor, whatever, uh-huh. and someone or a huge ass new feature, and someone's like, "Wait, new thread. We need to discuss this specific sub feature because yeah, really the whole is. range yeah. over funk thing is a really big issue. I'm, I'm not sure even most people understand it or like it or or, sh- or they're not sure where they use it, and then people will get into it. Get you know, I've been writing with it for a while and it's working really well. The discussion here is about a specific implementation detail of Let's imagine you're uh, ranging over the seek, right? The sequence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is, uh, let's uh, range over a map, right? And get they have keys and values. Right. So your, your function returns two key things. value. Um, and then you call it multiple times and you get multiple copies, your multiple instances of key value pairs. And I remember discussing this on the show and being like, yeah. damn, this other than the fact that the type is called seek2 with, yeah. the, with the number <laughs> two in it, which is just fugly. Uh, there's, I had no issues with it. Like I right. couldn't think Agreed. of a problem. But mm-hmm. um, as stuff happens in software development, the team has been using this for a while, right? And they've come up with a case where it doesn't work so well, uh, where it's not key value, which you just imagine, oh, for KV equals whatever. That's what I've been doing in all the other languages. What happens when it's for value and er? And it's been very unergonomic to write it. And the reason this is a problem is because by convention, uh, and this is already true with the slices of maps, you can emit the second variable, right? But if you only want the keys in your map, you just say for key well, equals range map. And you just get the keys and you don't get the values. But for functions, obviously, that doesn't work because you have to do, let's say you want to ignore the error, which, by the way, in a, in a function that you iterate over, Kind of makes sense, you know, because you expect the iterator to finish if it's uh, EOF. It's very context specific, I think. In some cases, you might want to ignore the error. In some cases, you don't. And it's it's mostly it's it's mostly frustrating having to write, uh, you know, I explicitly ignore in some places. It, the way you ignore the return values in Go is you assign them to underscore, right? So in your range expression, you assign the error to an underscore. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, and honestly, it it really isn't. I think they're really workshopping all the little tiny frictions that they're going into, and they're not afraid to rework it, which, in my opinion, is good overall, like for the success of this feature. But it it does end up with, I don't know, a hundred comments discussion on whether we should or shouldn't omit, uh, allow to omit this, uh, this, you know, variable, which you can ignore anyway, right? You can assign it to underscore. And this entire discussion is about whether you can drop the underscore and just do like for value in whatever. And let's imagine this whatever, this function is you iterating over uh, lines from a buffer, right? You iterate over lines from your WebSocket. Mm -hmm. So you write a function that reads a line from the WebSocket or, you know, the next message or whatever. I imagine like a Kafka iterator or something like that. And you don't care about errors at all in this case. Uh, because you, I don't know, handle it in some other level. That makes a lot of sense. Let's say if we're talking about Kafka, uh, you have one layer that reads from Kafka, deals with all the parsing error, deals, whatever. And then you just wrap this whole thing with a message iterator that you just want it to work. You don't want to worry about anything. You just want to worry about the message. You just want to iterate over the messages. Uh, but you still need to be able to return error in case something horrible happened. But then you want to ignore it, let's say, in, one, in the tests. Because in the tests, you don't care about the error. Or maybe the other way around, by the way. Maybe you need the error in test, but in production, you're like, ah, oh, whatever, it's good enough. This proposal is all about allowing you to just iterate over a function that returns two values and ignoring the second one. The main case being ignoring er. I don't know if I'm for this one, by the way, overall. Even though I've been praising the whole uh, process, like the workshopping it of it is beautiful, yeah. I don't love the fact that you can omit, uh, like the, the value and key value. Yeah, I, I think... I, I would be in favor of requiring the explicit underscore. I'll, honestly, I'd be in favor of that in all cases, even for maps and slices that we have today. Of course, they're not going to make that change, but uh, yeah, because that's going <laughs> to be backwards. Piss off a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I think more explicit is better. Less. Magic. I've never, I've never written like you know slightly more explicit code, 
and have been like, oh, I really regret that time invested. Exactly. It just never happened to me. Exactly. Um, and there have been times when I've done 4K comma blank equals whatever. And then my linter or whatever tells me to remove that. I'm like, okay, I guess I will since you told me to. But I wish I could <laughs> leave it there because it, it's, more, it's more explicit. But yeah, I'm in favor of... As I'm going to do it, but I don't like it. Right. <laughs> this this whole episode, I don't know if this is just because we're both kind of uh, tired out of our, our minds. But this whole episode just sounds like quotes from my daughter. <laughs> I'm going to do it, but not because I'm happy about it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this proposal is new. Again, it's part of a whole big thing. So it's not uh, new in the same sense that we just discussed with the, you know, safer OS stuff, right? It's already during implementation of other thing. We changed, wanted to change one thing to another thing. Most people here, by the way, agree with dropping air, uh, which is surprising to me because I'm not in favor. There is the, I don't want to say unfortunate because it's i don't think it is unfortunate but there is the thing to note that russ uh who i think is leading this fe- feature for sure uh is the one who opened this discussion and clearly has an opinion uh so i think unless something drastic will happen you know he's the person uh in the trenches right uh so i trust his opinion a lot more than my two bucks analysis here on the show so i got a cool link on our channel i like cool links uh, our channel, the ad break is really soon, so I'm going to plug it uh, quickly. Cup of Go uh, Kebab Case on the Go for Slack uh, has been home for really interesting links and, and discussions and, and jokes and japes. And, uh, and Peter and links. Uh, and Peter uh, has been listening to the show and actually been listening to me, which is interesting. <laughs> A funny decision. And I've been working at work uh, on fixing flaky tests. Actually, since we've uh, discussed this, we already implemented a flaky test like detection pipeline that works automatically and sends messages. And then we got some responses from some teams. Cool. So you're going to fix them. <laughs> so, you know, uh, some teams are really overloaded with uh, features right now. So we're actually fixing some tests. It's a really interesting, like, cultural discussion as well. And just in time, two days ago, uh, Uber uh, released a flaky test overall at Uber. They have a huge, if you don't know, Uber has a really big engineering culture thing, right? They have a lot of open source. They have a lot of uh, blog posts. I think they're really big into engineering branding. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I assume they even have an Uber like developer podcast, just assuming. Uh, but maybe we need to find it. So they uh, started tackling uh, flaky tests. Just, uh, you know, for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the term, what are flaky tests, John? Um, well, they're tests that, that don't, they aren't consistent. Yeah. Is that, is that a fair way to put it? They aren't consistent. I, I would uh, categorize them as the devil, but you know, <laughs> to each their own. <laughs> um, so it's basically tests that fail randomly and then let's break down randomly into, okay. So they break down. If you run them in the incorrect order, they break down statistically because they rely on, on, some DB residue or Mm -hmm. something that has to do with time or something that has to do with undefined behavior, right? Uh, Let's say uh, init uh, order in Go up until a recent version was undefined. So if your test Mm -hmm. uh, relied on that, it it is flaky. Even if it is passing deterministically, it can be flaky. But the the fact that uh, a test can be flaky is not the part that matters. The part that does matter is you're working on a super critical feature at 5 a.m. before a demo, right? You've been working all night and you're trying to push your branch with the critical fix and the test fails and you're debugging it and then you rerun and it passes and you want to die. This is a really (laughs) bad developer experience. Yeah. And they went all out, man. This blog post is is amazing. It really shows the difference between small scale and big scale enterprise-y software development. Um, where like they have a goal, they developed a whole subsystem in Uber. They're calling it Testopedia that shares, you know, they share the structure where basically they monitor uh, all the tests and every test has a, a life cycle, right? Where it can be stable, which is the good state. It can be unsound which is the service marks it as, oh, this is uh, flaky, basically. And then a human can either delete it or disable it. 
And the system can decide to automatically delete it as well if it's too unsound for too long. So if a flaky test is flaky and the team doesn't get to it, the system automatically deletes it. And, you know, the, the moment something gets into unsound, a, a Jira ticket is fired off. It's a really interesting system. They even had to worry about like the scale of it, right? Analyzing the test data. This is just something that, you know, we have a lot of tests at Orca where I work, but this is not the scales we're looking at. Like, this is pretty amazing. There's some really interesting Go specific stuff here as well. Uh, I think the way they share their data model is really good. If you're DevOps, you should read this. If you're engineering enablement, you should read this. I got this link for from like seven uh, different people, but uh, thanks a lot, Peter, for uh, sending it to me. You you were only seventh because uh, I checked the uh, the couple of goes like slightly less than the work <laughs> slack. That's the only reason. But it's a really really good. You know, there's something about a really good blog post that you read it has a lot of charts, has a lot of code. Everything's written super well that you feel like the person who wrote it was like, I just want to give this to you. I want to gift this to you. It's not like AI generated slop, top five list, whatever. And I'm really interested in your thoughts about their future plan. So they built this whole system and now they're working on developing LLMs to like generative AI to both resolve flaky tests automatically, like suggest a fix and find the uh, categorization, like explain why this test is flaky, not just the fact that it is flaky. In your experience, you know, dealing with these tests, do you think that's even feasible or is every flaky test a unicorn? I think in some cases it's feasible uh, for some, uh, I mean, so I actually have a few flaky tests I deal with on a regular basis. I, I have a pretty strong idea of why each one happens, but they've been happening long enough that I've, I've built that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm faced with a brand new flaky test, Often it does require investigation to, to determine that. And I, I imagine an LLM could, could help in many cases to help you know, pinpoint that. You know, this is a data race or this is a, a, um, a timing bug or this is you know, test execution order, whatever. I, I'm not sure. I just have a feeling like it's slightly too complicated for just shoving it into ChatGPT and asking it why it's flaky. But maybe if they have their own like if they're at the point of developing and training their own models, then maybe, but I'm not yeah. sure. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it wouldn't have to, it wouldn't have to solve even a large percentage of them to be helpful. If it, if it could point you to the right answer for 10%, that's, that's the big value. The The problem I have is if the other 90%, it's like pointing you towards a solution that ends up wasting your time because it looks yeah. correct, but it's not really. That wouldn't be helpful at all. Anyway, their numbers at the end are also staggering. They're like, quote, in the Go monorepo, we are steadily detecting around a thousand flaky tests. And I'm like, what? That's horrible. Yeah. And then you finish reading it and it says, quote, out of 600,000 in total. That's so many tests. That's a lot of tests. This is a taxi company, right? (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so thanks a lot for sharing this link. It was super interesting to me. I also, it was, you know, how you know a link is really good. The time between you took you to read it and the time you sent it in work slack. uh, For me, it was almost instant. So thanks a lot, Peter. Keep keep them coming, man. Uh, We really like your contributions in the channel. One last story that was uh, brought to us by the channel, uh, the same channel. Uh, (laughs) Sounds like a cult. The channel, the, the greater yeah, good. Yeah. So I, I found a different article talking about the same story, though. Um, but the, the headline is Red Panda acquires Benthos to expand its end-to-end streaming data platform. Benthos, as you may recall, is a data streaming platform. We've interviewed uh, the, the creator of it on the show before. But you know that the biggest surprise to me here was that Red Panda is an actual thing and not just a made-up, you know, logo. Do you know what a Red Panda looks like? The animal? Yeah. I've seen one up close. It almost really? bit my uh, my nose off. Wow! In a zoo, so one time. They're it, really it cute. Looks, like I would have thought it was a Firefox mascot if uh, somebody <laughs> hadn't told me otherwise. But uh, yeah, they look really cute. They're also uh, like low maintenance zoo animals. My mother in law told me because she used to work in a zoo. I'll keep that in mind next time I open a low maintenance zoo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine you running a high maintenance one. Uh, so what's up with this article, man? This sounds like huge news. Do you know any anything about it? Can you can you grok it, figure it out? Yeah. So like I don't know. One of the most interesting things here, other than the fact that the red pandas are real and they're cute, is that uh, as a result of this announcement of this acquisition, that Red Panda is acquiring Benthos, a new team has come out to fork Benthos. It's it's like 
terraform all over again. Terraform and open tofu, right? Yeah, I think I, I tried to read about. It. There's a lot. There's a lot of nuance here. It's not like yeah. all of Ventos got bought and then everything got forked. We need to dive deeper here. I'm kind of con- like, honestly, I find it kind of confusing. I, I I wonder if if so we can get an expert. Oh, you know what? I think I have actually Jeff's on my speed dial here. Maybe we could get him on the show to the speed dial mobile. Welcome to our ad break. We have uh, Ashley on hold here, so I'm going to rush really fast. If you want to help sponsor the show like the rest of our beautiful, beautiful uh, members on Patreon, we would love for you to do it. This show is a hobby, but it's pretty expensive. We have to pay for editing and hosting fees and stuff like that. So if you like the show, if it's useful for you at your work or university, uh, supporting us eight bucks a month is uh, really nice. To find the link to our Patreon or maybe to our swag store where you can uh, hook yourself up with some hoodies, cups, whatever. To find our Slack channel where uh, we just talked about the uh, link Peter shared. You can find everything at cupago.dev. That is cupago.dev. If all these fancy communication uh, platforms are not your thing and you're not into Slack, you can also email us at news at kapago.dev. Another way to support the show that we really appreciate, we don't pay to advertise anything. Well, I don't know. I pay for internet to share people the link to the show. I don't want to say anything, anything. But we don't pay for ads, as you would think about them. This show is only spread by word of mouth. So share the show with a friend, a colleague, co-student, whatever. Uh, and leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. It helps us, uh, you know, get to the rankings and uh, get into some random listeners' hands. Uh, we've gotten some really good feedback about the show recently on LinkedIn and on Slack, and I even got some face-to-face at work. And I'm really hoping to, you know, run into some uh, listeners in Amsterdam uh, where we're going to have our... Uh, I'm going to go to DevOps days and we're going to have a meetup on uh, June 19th. So we're really excited about the direction the show is taking. Uh, and your support is a big part of that. Thanks a lot. And I think we're just going to jump into the interview. See you next week. Listen, I told you not to call me this number again. Next time, there's going to be consequences. This is an emergency, Ash. We know this is the never call you on this number line, but the people need to know about red pandas. <laughs> wait, that's not the... Oh, red panda. Oh, oh, wait. There's only one, yeah. <laughs> hello, Ash. Hello. Thanks for taking my call. Hello, hello. Even though this is, <laughs> this is the wrong number. <laughs> the red phone. <laughs> when, when we're done with the call, can you uh, return this uh, briefcase with this uh, phone to the president? <laughs> no. <laughs> so welcome uh ashley jeffs uh also known as jafail uh online for the people who don't know you do can you briefly present who you are uh so i'm that guy what did the uh blobfish uh benthos open source project thing um you may if you're in the ghost space you might also know me from my project called gabs and there's another even less popular one called tunny i've got a few 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 fingers in various open source pies in the ghost space uh, all with rather silly logos, hmm. um, but obviously the more successful one is is Benthos, which is a open source stream processor, and that's all written in Go. Yummy, yum, yum, yum. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much. I do lots of YouTube stuff. People might know me from that because I've got. I actually have content that's not related to my various open source projects, but is related to Go sometimes. Nice. Um, so people might know me from that, but probably fewer. Cool. Uh, but you can find me on there and Twitter and all the other places. We'll have links Here. to all that in the show notes. And if you're a longtime listener, you may remember we had Ash and uh, Michai on the show, like, I don't know what it was, a year ago? Yeah, probably. Let me look it up. Did I think about it? Damn, that was that that was long ago, man. Are you going to sound by all the stupid stuff I said? <laughs> That's a really good idea. We might ask uh, <laughs> Filippo to edit all that stuff in. Uh, so a lot has changed since uh, that last uh recording we did since that last interview and we need to talk about it what do you think about my new tattoo 
<laughs> it's not a blobfish, so I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, so the big news this week, obviously, uh, is everybody on both sides of the aisle uh, agree that your code is great. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Ventos got acquired by Red Panda. Yeah. Uh, now it's called Red Panda Connect. Like there's a thing called Red Panda Connect and there's still the Ventos yeah. uh, open source library. Uh, and we want to talk about that and try to understand what happened. We want to congratulate you, by the way, first and foremost. Thank you. Dude, that's great. That's a really, really good move. Red Panda, by the way, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, really good stewards of open source stuff, really cool guys. So, you know, this would have been a different tone if this was like IBM. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, not if we have listeners in IBM, not not like they're, they're actually. I would say they're not doing a bad job with Cerama. I actually think the changes. I, I'm trying to think about a company that I really want to like name and shame in in terms of. So then I thought about it a bit some more. And then let's steer away from that sp- specific part of the conversation. <laughs> I don't know if Saudi Aramco nukes would, tech. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Seal Clubbing Inc. If they brought Ventus, <laughs> I wouldn't have been. No, down. they're doing really well with their open source libraries. <laughs> they actually built the PPROF. <laughs> um, so anyway, congrats about that. We really want Thank to you. get into it and what happens in the future. Uh, but just in case someone you know wants to understand this news but doesn't know what Ventus really is, and they, we don't want to send them back to old episodes. Can you give like a one minute summary of what this open source project is and why is it so big? I can't promise one minute. Um, Basically, what we had, so for about 10 years, I've been working on this open source project. It's a stream processor. If you don't really know what that is, it's basically something that reads from message queues and things like Kafka and your NATs and RabbitMQ, that kind of stuff. And what I built is a, a sort of engine for doing all that stuff with the decorative config. So rather than having to write code and all that stuff, you can just write some structured YAML. And just this emphasis on operational simplicity. So making sure it's really easy for people to build those configs and maintain them. But also when you deploy this stream processor, it doesn't do any nasty stuff. And that's basically uh, ingrained in me from my time working on services like that and seeing how badly the operations people suffered when they had to deploy services like that. So things like data loss, back pressure, recovery, metrics, observability, all that stuff. Um, It's very, very hard in the stream processing space. As the project grew, the number of connectors we had um, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the community got bigger and bigger and bigger. But it was all organic. It was all just me living on my own off various. So I've, I've gone through the rounds of monetization strategies. I've tried about it's been like five different phases, which we can go into in detail if you want, um, of me trying to monetize it essentially without VC funding. I ruled that out a few years ago, that basically I didn't want to do that for a number of reasons. And the project was getting to the point where it was too much for me to be the only person working on it full time. And we have contributors, um, but they're also doing their own thing, trying to live off you know, their own means and figure stuff out on their own. So we didn't really have the ability to expand from that. So I was trying to find lots of ways of bootstrapping some sort of company without sacrificing family life and the ability to watch TV and video games. Um, And I've been pretty open over the years of how that's been going (laughs) uh, to varying levels of success. Um, And eventually it got to the point where, okay, I needed to make a decision and the timing was right. It wasn't exactly when I expected to do this, but I was basically, this was on my list of options at the end of the journey. Mm-hmm. And it was it was coming to that point anyway. Um, so what's happened now is I've sold the project. So there's been an acquisition of the company behind Benthos. And what's happened is, so it used to be fully MIT licensed, all the connections and the engine. We already had the plan in the open source community, just in general, to separate the core stream processing engine from the connectors themselves. Um, and the idea is that you would decentralize so people can have any suite of connectors that they want um, because they all have different dependency trees and different runtime uh, weirdnesses. And it was just becoming really cumbersome having all of them baked into this one open source project. So we wanted to split those out anyway. So what the acquisition has done is it's fast-tracked the splitting of We've got an MIT licensed core engine, which is the plugin engines, the stream processing engine, all the important stuff, uh, all the stuff that makes Benthos Benthos. That's still called Benthos. Mm -hmm. Red Panda Benthos, if if you want to uh, fully adhere to uh, trademarks, but you're not going to get sued just for saying Benthos. Mm -hmm. 
But the other bit is called Red Panda Connect, and that's essentially the distribution of essentially using Benthos as a library to build all of these plugins. We've relicensed most of them to Apache 2, and then there's two that we've enterprise licensed as part of the monetization strategy. So basically, the acquisition purpose is to try and find a way of sustaining a team of engineers to work on this project and not sacrifice their lives doing it. And hopefully that's going to be healthier for the project. But who knows? It's only been a week. Yeah. <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? Pretty fresh, huh? Yeah. So are you going to stay on the team? Will you be still working there? Or are you going to the Bahamas yeah. now and you're done? No, I'm staying, I'm staying right. on it. Uh, I don't have to, but I'm staying. I'm sticking around. I mean, my, my intention now is to build out enough people who, so th- there's like lots of different groups of people that I can, I can create. I can spawn mm-hmm. them. Um, so there's obviously people who just are able to support uh, Red Panda Connect users. Red Panda Connect is a lot. So I'm, I'm starting to shorten that to uh, Red Necked. Just the, the red at the beginning and the necked at the end. Red necked. All right. We need, we need Jeff Foxworthy on here now. <laughs> yeah, I can hear but, the, the radio uh, ads already, right? Like banjo twang. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, y'all. Uh, shout out to all my uh, southern US friends. Do you know, I, I have to do, do this. Do you know that uh, in old Unix I'm not sure if it's Unix or Linux, but really old distributions. Redneck was a language. Like you could install it in English, like Spanish, French, Hebrew, like whatever, Russian, and Redneck. Not as a joke. One of the engineers was a Redneck and it would be like, (laughs) yep, nope. In the, I'll look that up. There's a screenshot here. I found in 1998, Red Hat had Redneck as a language option. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) It could happen. (laughs) <laughs> that means I can't, I can't trademark it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm building out people who can help support because right now it's the developers who work on the Benthos ecosystem and they, they are also in the questions channels, the discords, the slacks, answering all the questions. And most of the time you're, you're, you're basically consulting for free, right? Because people are coming in and saying like, how do I do X to Y and do this blah, 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 and use case blah. And it's like, that's, that's, it's great that we can help those people. But we're not going to be able to do that forever because the community is getting bigger. So we're not we're not going to be able to just answer those questions. We're not going to spend half an hour every morning answering some random consulting questions. So the idea is we're going to expand the number of people who can help, just generally help um, and understand the the service. Then we're expanding the people who can work on it because right now there's lots of people who've contributed features on top of the engine. So people who are adding like fields to connectors and documentation and a new connector here and there. There's like a small pool of people who contribute quite a few bits um, consistently. But the the number of people who really get down and dirty in the core stream processing engine is basically just me and maybe me high to a to a slight degree. But if you look at the the real nasty like gnarly bits, the really takes a lot of brain power to get all the factors of stream processing right. Imagine like delivery guarantees. Uh, vertical scaling, back pressure, and you know all the other bits. You, you know usability, error handling, all those things. To get all of that right for some of these bits is really difficult. So I obviously can't be the only person on the planet who knows how to do that mm-hmm. stuff because it's just going to degrade over time. Like the the project will degrade if I disappear from it. So the idea is I want to onboard more people with enough time to get stuck into that stuff, which is already happening. So it's not just me who has to work on that stuff in theory. Mm-hmm. And then it's just better for everybody, right? And then, you know, obviously more people are working on the connectors, more people consulting. So it's, it's just a general uh, endeavor to expand the community. Because, I mean, as well, I'm doing all the graphics, all mm. the documentation, mm. all the videos, all the training materials. All of that stuff was just me, which is great fun. And it, it means that all the content can be equally ironic <laughs> and just generally silly because, you know, I'm not a professional, so I'm just doing all this stuff for yeah. fun. Um, which has been great, but that can't that can't last forever because you can't you can't just have one person doing all those things forever. I really love the 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 like student listening to the show, being like the guy who just sold his ten year project to a reputable streaming company. Like, no, I'm not a professional. <laughs> <laughs> My family are like, did you, did Ash, did you sell the blobfish? Is that what's happened? So <laughs> they don't get yeah, any. Yeah. So I'm curious. Before this acquisition, how much of your time was dedicated to this? Was this full time for you? Yeah. Well, okay. So, full time is 
so the the public face of what's happening right is a fraction of my time spent on the project as a whole because what i'm having to do to survive is spin all these plates not just for my current income but also like trying to figure out what am i going to do in like a year mm-hmm. <laughs> what what, mm-hmm. what am i going to live off in a year's time and trying to get to that point where i can hire more people is the old, the the main goal so i'm you know i was dedicating a lot of my time to just that you know that it was getting to the point where i would almost spend all my time some weeks working on that mm-hmm. stuff because i don't like i don't know how much of your audience are solo entrepreneurs um but just doing stuff like procurement like getting getting a company you have a company that is desperate to throw money at mm-hmm. and they want to they want to have a support contract and then it goes to procurement yeah. and it's like oh no we can't we can't give you money you're just some guy in the uk mm-hmm. <laughs> we mm-hmm. can't do that and you know i'm i'm spending my time reading through like 60 page contracts and talking to random people through email trying to figure all this stuff out. And it, it means that the amount of time I was spending on the project was getting smaller and smaller. Just I was also admin. working on Benthos Studio, which is like a complete closed source um, spin-off thing, which is basically a visual UI for mm. it, which I like, that was, ba- that was my big plan for the next, for, for essentially this year and last year was to try and monetize that. But again, it's, it's the procurement that ends up killing me. So now that the acquisition's done, are you employed by Red Panda or, okay. Yeah. and yeah, so I'm badge and everything, company badge, mm-hmm. company uniform. I don't have the company badge yet. I got a laptop. Oh, there you so go. Damn. I can fight my way into a physical office. <laughs> everything. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got a, an official title. I'm Connect Technical Lead. All right. So I'm I'm running the the project to to continue, you know, working on this thing, expanding the team, expanding the resources. I, like I'm still going to be doing the pull request features, all that stuff. So from one day to the next, the main thing that changed was who pays your salary. Yeah. But, but over the coming months, you're building a bigger team to help offload yeah. a lot of those tasks. But, but also all that time I was spending on trying to like essentially solve next year's income, mm-hmm. I no longer have to spend any time on any of that. I've now got yeah. a, there's a sales team that I can hand stuff over to. There's you know there's sales engineers that I can liaise with, and you know I don't have to worry about any of that stuff now. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's freed up a huge amount of my time. Obviously I've just joined this company and I'm getting all of them up, up to speed. So that's taking up, you know, some of my time, but already I'm, I'm spending more time on pull requests and I'm not like, there was, there was this horrible sensation. I've generally always enjoyed working on the project and especially being free to just do whatever the hell I want, right? Make mm-hmm. whatever decisions I want, um, has been a wild ride, but it was getting to the point where because I was stressing about it doesn't look like this is going to work and I was worrying about, oh no, what if I have to, because I'm not, I, I decided against VC funding just because I don't think I'm going to enjoy that job um, mm-hmm. if I'm like a CEO of like a VC funded startup. Um, and it was going to eventually lead to tough decisions that I wasn't going to want to make around licensing and all those things. Um, and the the worry that I had over the last like year or two is I'm merging pull requests and I know that I have to support what I'm merging. That's always the contract, right? Because I'm mm-hmm. I'm the face of the project. People are coming to me when they have questions and ultimately it ends with me. If there's nobody else volunteering their time in the in the chat channels, um, then it will land on me eventually. And anything that I build to try and live off, I'm also supporting this whole bag of this massive burden of connectors, all these different technologies. And what I was finding is I, I used to be able to fit all of it in my head. So somebody would come with a feature, I'd merge it, I'd understand it, and it would just be there in my mind. And it was getting to the point where that wasn't the case anymore. So I was merging, you know, like MongoDB connectors or um, Google Cloud connectors. And people would come along and say, oh, how, how does this thing work? And I wouldn't even be able to tell them that that component exists. Like yeah. I wouldn't even know what's in my own thing that I'm running. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's stressful, you know, mer- mer- like, cause I don't want to stop people's pull requests from being merged. Right. I don't want to like prevent because mm-hmm. people have already done that work. They've, they put the effort in. So I don't want to mm-hmm. block them, but I, I don't have enough time to do the merging. I mean, even when I do, I'm like freaking out about it. Whereas now I have a team of people who can help me with all that stuff. So me merging pull requests is just about, is it good code quality? Does it fit the, you know, the overall purpose of the project? Is it going to help people? If that's mm-hmm. all yeses, then merge. And that's it. Mm-hmm. As simple as it gets. <laughs> awesome. That's nice. We're laughing because uh, the, the fireworks did a thumbs up. Yeah, did a thumbs up. And... Yeah. and do you see a difference? Or I guess what differences do you see 
between stewarding, you know, a herd of open source cats developers uh, in trying to direct this sort of open source chaotic energy versus, you know, a team in a company that like has a purpose. I'm trying to abbreviate the the title as well. So your redneck teed, your red Petna connect technical leadership is probably a lot more. I get that you've only been there a week. Maybe that's an unfair question. But you plan for it to be slightly more structured, I guess, than... Um, there's going to be aspects of it, yeah. So there, there's obviously going to be like enterprise features that we're going to want to have uh, to unblock customers and, you know, the, the usual businessy stuff. Those are obviously going to be things that we're going to try and fit in on a deadline. There's also going to be open source features that we're... I mean, same, same applies, you know, things that we're going to want to need as nice to have as we're going to use. So we want to get those in on a certain timeline. To be honest, that doesn't really change from my personal perspective, because I was always doing that. I was always setting deadlines and then slapping the keyboard until it was done. But getting other people on board, to be honest, it was at the point in the last couple of years where I felt as though I would be able to say, hey, Mihai, can you do this thing? And as long as it's something that's good, like obviously it's got to be good for the project, it's going to be fun to work on. He'd go and do it. I mean, he's doing it for free, right? So, you know, there's obviously within reason you, you know, you mm-hmm. do this stuff. But if it was something that was good for the project, there's been times where that's that's been the relationship we've had. So it's it's kind of like having employees light. Um mm-hmm. and as long as you're respectful and everybody is kind of on the same page, then you know, that's that's kind of what you're doing. So I guess you're kind of like it, it's the training wheels version of running a team where you're using, you know, motivation and mission to get that sort of stuff done. Whereas now I can just say, money! (laughs) Next week, or now. So I want to talk a little bit about the acquisition. So uh, Red Panda bought Benthos. Did you approach them? Did they approach you? I've known Alex for like five years. There there was other suitors. Um, It was kind of funny, because anybody following my movements for like uh, two, two months ago, I think it was, I was at I was at Kafka Summit hanging out with the Warp Stream guys at their booth, and then mm-hmm. you know I'm like spending a week in San Francisco, and everybody anybody that I'm interacting with online can just like track my movements and see what's happening. Yeah, so it's okay. like you, you can keep it you can keep it a secret to an extent, but I mean if people want that info, it is it is actually just there. It's it's yeah. not really particularly easy for me to. I've I've had a good relationship with Senadia for a long time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been they've been OGs. I mean, so my main monetization has has just been nothing for a couple of years, and I've been living off sponsors, and they're by far my biggest sponsor. They they basically kept me alive when I had my kid because uh, I didn't have time to to really chase up support contracts, and they just happened to appear at the right time. I'm like, what do you need? So yeah, I mean, I've obviously had conversations with lots of companies that are kind of the same the same ilk, where they're all partners in that sphere and mm-hmm. i mean i didn't i didn't really have like a, a a strict agenda or a timeline thing basically i can't really go into details specifically of what happened but stuff suddenly moved very very fast and it became apparent of like oh okay this is going to happen then i guess this can happen right now you don't need to answer this i mean i'm going to speculate i'm pretty sure i'm right on this the reason you chose red panda is because of their logo it's an animal <laughs> and that is uh with the benthos eth- uh, ethos of animal logos, they kind they kind of fit. I've already I've, so there's obviously been loads of fans making uh, mashups of the two logos uh-huh. in terms of in terms of mascot to um, to blobfish ratio. It's actually pretty good, I would say, definitely good, better than better than any of the other candidates. Because I mean, cute mascots is hard to get anyway. Yeah. Obviously, the red panda is very cute. Um, yeah, we wouldn't know because but- we knocked it out on the park like the first first try, but. <laughs> I assume for other people it's hard. <laughs> same. I just slapped a plotfish together. It's been the same for like ten years. But yeah, it's, it's a good brand. It fits fits very well with my brand vision. I think is what they say. Uh, the brand ecosystem. The cine- I keep saying the cinematic universe of blobfish. Uh, it kind of fits. The BCU. They're, they're, they're ca- <laughs> they're, yeah, they, they're compatible. And uh, you know, the, the acquisition basically means. Uh, you know, some people have been worried about, wait, acquisition, does that mean all the open source work is going away? You mentioned that the core is saying MIT license, which basically, you know, if you don't want to get into the legalese means open source and you don't have to worry about it too much because it's not the redhead license where it's copyleft. Um, 
And some of the plugins are enterprise, which makes sense. You know, Red Panda have to sell something. And the rest of it is Apache 2. Now, Apache 2 is kind of a new kid on the block. It's uh, the Elastic uh, Search uh, license, right? No, but it's, it's Apache V2 is just basically, I mean, it's basically MIT with a bit more legalese around it. So, I mean, you can do whatever you want. AWS could take all of that if they wanted oh, to. Oh, really? Don't AWS. Yeah, but Apache 2 is. Uh, <laughs> Probably is, have is people the from uh, AWS on the, on, the, on the podcast, you know what I mean? At least Tell one. them no. Don't <laughs> AWS. Actually, no. Go ahead. Go, go to town. Take, take all the connectors. I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, the move, so basically the move from MIT to Apache 2, I don't know why. <laughs> I was fine with it because it's basically the same license. Uh, mm-hmm. MIT is obviously more, is, is less wording. So you, you have even fewer protections like for what you're sharing. But the, the ethos is, I don't care. I'm just putting this out there. I don't really care what happens to it. Um, but Apache 2 has a bit more legalese around copyright, that sort of stuff. I have no idea what the implications there. I think it's to do with, you know, th- there are smarter people than me who understand the commercial side, figuring out that that's, that's better for insurance or whatever. I don't know. Um, and then the enterprise stuff, basically, it ju- we just need like a bit of enterprise stuff. We're obviously going to be adding cool features that are sort of like tacked onto Red Panda Connect um, just to make it work cooler. So, I mean, an example is we've already got um, a new config section specifically for Red Panda Connect where you can forward your logs directly to a topic, um, which is kind of cool. People have been asking for that for a while. And there's obviously going to be features that we're going to put on on top just to make them all work cooler together, I think Mm -hmm. is the official term. Um, but yeah, the the idea is just one connector or two that are enterprise. There's two. It's the Splunk and the Snowflake ones, and you know basically the mentality there is you're already paying for Splunk. If you're using Splunk, you're paying for it, and if you're using Snowflake, you're paying for it. You're paying for it multiple times over because your data is getting leaked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The of the week. Or maybe they're making money from that. I don't know. Maybe you get a kickback for your data going. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works. <laughs> joke I, don't insur- sue me <laughs> insurance companies are the one pocketing all the the difference trust me cyber insurance i guess yeah um but yeah that, that's the mentality obviously we're, we're already working on expanding them i mean pe- people were um obviously hyper aware on the day of well you've just relicensed enterprise on something that was mit which is 100 percent correct um the goal was to show people what the separation was going to be for the announcement but obviously, we're not we're just going to leave it as it is. <laughs> it's just leave it enterprise license. We're, go, we're going to expand it and, and basically redo them mm-hmm. and you know beef them up a little bit. Stuff that we couldn't really do or have the resources. Because I mean, I don't, I can't maintain a Splunk connector on my own. It's like an open source thing. It's currently a template, and it's just basically using the HTTP component under the hood. And it's like I can't, I can't. Like if anybody asks me a question on that, I would have to go and fish out. Um, the a friend with a Splunk server, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I can't, I can't run it, like, and there's no, there's, there's not really a lot of tooling for. I think there is like a, a VM you can run now, but I, I remember at the time somebody was asking me about it. I was like, I can't, I can't do anything for you. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, obviously now we've got the resources. But yeah, so there's there's two two components that have been uh, enterprise licensed. Then what we've done is because it used to be that you would import all of the connectors sometimes as like a full suite. If you just want to have like a custom build that has everything in it, all the plugins, uh, they used to be like a macro. And obviously, um, now that there's licensed components, that's a bit dubious for people. So what I've done is I've separated out packages that are all the Apache licensed connectors or all including the enterprise ones, and you can pick one. And I've got explicit licenses now. So um, at least now you're not, like now you can be 100% sure if you're making a build whether it's fully open source or not. I mean, I've, I've never run a multi-licensed project before, so it was a bit of a learning experience for me. But yeah, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to, to have a custom build with whatever you want in there. What's the use case for, like, I get why you would want all the processors, because I don't see them as, like, super heavy, and you, oh, suddenly I have protobuf, suddenly I just, I want to start playing around the blob blank, whatever. But why would you need all the inputs and outputs? Like, I can't imagine a system that gets, I don't want to imagine a system that has Cassandra, Discord, the Twitter, SQL, Mongo, and HDFS as the inputs. I just like please you just tell describe me that my website. Yeah. So <laughs> the I think the the, the main reason is um, so I've got a bit of insight into this, but basically when when you're a company that's big enough, you've got teams all over the world that have all grown independently. So they all have, they all use different tools and services. Some of them came in through acquisition. So they, you know, they they made all these decisions before they were in part of the company. And you need to have the ability for all of these 
teams to kind of collaborate. So these sorts of tools that connect all of these different technologies together are, are really important. And they're so important that you end up having a team internally that is in charge of it. So they will have their own like custom plugins that they'll write for it. And they'll have their own like um, framework for how you're supposed to deploy this thing and uh, best practices, all that kind of stuff, how to do it securely, all these things that you should you should be doing. And, you know, we use this deployment mechanism and you do it with this and blah, 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 here's some templates. They'll have their own internal documentation, all this stuff. Um, and for them, they just want to have this like mega binary that is going to solve all the use cases that they maintain. So they only have one build mm-hmm. um, and they, they won't necessarily even know what connectors they're going to need when they're, when they're shipping this thing out. So it's almost like they are, um, they're, they're almost like a, a Benthos distribution that's just internal. Um, and I know a lot of organizations that do that, like when, when they eventually get to that size where it becomes this massive problem to solve, um, it, it becomes really important that if you're giving people this tool to solve it themselves, um, you're giving them, you know, everything, uh, which is, it does seem like a lot because the binary size is like a hundred meg, hundred megabytes in, in the Java world. That's not a big deal, but in, in the Go world, that's massive. Yeah. Well, with all the dependencies on, like I assume the core engine is like you know kind of tiny. A meg. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it is. I think it's pretty small. So you it is all the client libraries. Specifically, AWS is pretty big. I saw you have uh, Azure. I remember. I really hope you don't have to ever do as part of you know a client to deal whatever the uh, Microsoft Graph API as an input. Because let me tell you, man, they just took the entire C sharp <laughs> code base. And I don't know what they did to it. They like transpiled it into Go, and their Go oh, package dear. is like two and a half gigs if you add no. it to your build. No. Something crazy. I remember it, it literally crashed our GitHub uh, pipelines last time we tried to uh, integrate it, and we ended up like not using the the SDK. We just yeah, like uh, copied uh, files out of it, and they were like, "Yeah, we're not really gonna maintain it." So sorry on GitHub. <laughs> Speaking of stuff that's not going to get maintained. No, nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> so, so you talked about uh, Snowflake and Splunk being like uh, two connectors. You talked about growing a team. Are there any other exciting features on the horizon now that you have, I assume, oh, yeah, internal loads. Red Panda integrations? I don't know. Is the studio like getting a front, like, you know, it's going to be front and center, the UI stuff? Like what's going on? What's the, what, so, what are Bento's uh, fans? Uh, should look forward to now that you they don't have to worry about you you know ending up on the street there's um so console is uh, another product we got it's open source red panda console um that is already able to give you a an editor with autocomplete for bentos configs damn so they've been they've been working on that at the same time that you know we were working on the um repo split there's also tooling around um we're probably going to take studio and just like break it up into bits because there's lots of problems that I solved with Studio that will probably fit in different places better than than just having one central thing. But yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to start moving um, some of that good stuff out into better kind of like tools that we can give people. But I mean, the the console uh, editing experience is, is, is like people have been asking me for autocomplete for years. And I, I basically just put my hands up and said, I'm, I can't do it. I'm just not capable. I, I don't know what tools I would need to do. Like I, I built a visual editor before I could muster the front end magic to get autocomplete to work. And yet the, you know, the console team, they, they had it pretty much immediately. Like they, they were like, yeah, give us the bits and tapa, tapa, tapa. It did some stuff on a laptop, which looked sus. <laughs> and then suddenly they've got autocomplete in console. So yeah, I mean, cool. there's there's obviously going to be like integrations into Red Panda, but there's also going to be stuff because I mean, con- you don't need console with um, you can just use that. But obviously, most most of the functionality that we're going to be talking about is is stuff that's going to be cool with Red Panda. But the stuff that the open source community is going to be interested in specifically is just more support on the core engine. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point I'll be doing performance improvements. Um, stuff like that that I just haven't had time for. Lots of more connectors. Pull requests are finally going to be free to to get merged. The the pull requests will flow once more, um, <laughs> and just more more hands on deck, more stuff, Ooh. more bits. Is that specific enough for you? There's going to be stuff and bits. I'm really I excited when you said performance because the, the the moment you say okay, my thing is stable enough. When when I say my thing, I mean your business and both uh, like both your business and your project are stable enough that I can like, I just want to come to work one day and profile it and make it better. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that means that it, it's actually providing so much value for so many people that humanity have, uh, has like, okay, little funny man, sit in your box and make it better. <laughs> 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 Although I don't know if that analogy is apt because I don't know if you're actually little. Like all your I think blog I'm pitch. pretty small. I'm pretty small. <laughs> I'm you need here. to meet me at a summit. I think you'll tower over me. I'm a pretty <laughs> tall guy, yeah. I like actually, it that way. I don't I like know being how nimble. tall Jonathan is, but I'm going to find out in two weeks. Find Come to Amsterdam. Oh, okay. Let's hang out. <laughs> well, actually, I'm actually not busy. far. No, not too far. Ooh. What? Off what? the record, we're going we're gonna to coerce you to, to come. <laughs> With um, what? What do you one, one last question about the, uh, you know, uh, Red Panda stuff. You uh, said you knew this guy like before, uh, and they yeah. actually sponsored a project. And, and things like that. Like, where did you meet them? Just through Benthos? Or, you know, did you go to high school with these guys? <laughs> no, I didn't go to school. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, I mean, you, you end up just kind of like um, mingling through like blogs and stuff. So I, I remember when Red Panda was announced uh, publicly, it was, it was when it was like fresh. And my immediate reaction was, I can finally run Kafka integration tests. Because up until that mm. point, it was like Zookeeper, and it was an absolute nightmare to get it running in a in a like test framework without having like a, a dedicated server for it, which I was not going to do. And then Red Panda comes along, and it's like you can just run it, like you just run it quick, and it's it's low memory and all that stuff. So I, I immediately jumped on that as oh my god, it's amazing. And then I think basically they had some some users who were already using Benthos, and they obviously talked about that. And then Alex reached out to me and it's the whole, you know, we'll do a blog together and post it on our website, post it on your website and you know, mix. And it's, it's a good way of getting people to kind of discover new tools because up until that point, I, I had basically no connections. That was about five years ago. I had no connections with anybody else in, I said, no, it was probably 2020, I think, actually, not that long mm-hmm. ago. I said, oh, no, that's almost five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but back when I was a little and, Back when I was a little kiddo, yeah, I, d- I didn't really have any like interaction with the the, the bigger, more established tools because you know I was kind of like this organic developer driven. I didn't really have any like corporate presence. Like no, nobody at Kafka Summit was talking about this blobfish project by this kid. Um, so it was all it was all kind of like de- developer driven. But I think we we kind of like matched in um, our general marketing pitch because you know the whole pitch with Benthos is it's just way simpler than the other tools, both to use and to run. And the, the term that I was kind of using and still use to an extent today is that the operational simplicity is you've got this thing, you're running it and it's, it's simple in how it behaves. Fewer hours on pages in the middle of the night, that sort of stuff. And they're obviously very, very similar because it's, you know, it's Kafka without the hassle. It's basically Red Panda. It's better performance and better behavior and, you know, easier to deploy and manage. Um, so yeah, we, we just kind of started interacting based on that and. You know, it's, it's the same with all these other like companies that you know you end up you end up interacting online, have a call just to say like, hey, what's up? And then you know sometimes it's through VCs as well. Mm-hmm. Venture capitalists like to connect you with people, um, so that's that's like a whole uh, avenue for for getting contacts. I heard someone you have that to... say that's the only thing they're good for. <laughs> no, <laughs> not me. Not no, me. no, no, no. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh. I, I, I want to. I want to ask one question that might be a little bit sensitive. The day after the announcement, Warpstream announced that they had forked mm-hmm. Benthos. Uh, I, I don't want to go into too many details there. That their announcement was, I don't know, a little bit adversarial. What are your thoughts? And I'll just leave it open like that. So the, like I said, that month was a bit wild. Um, obviously, I was hanging out with Warpstream. I still, I, I like all the Warpstream people uh, personally. Um, they're in a difficult spot because, so I think essentially the big, the big thing that happened is people discovered that Kafka Connect is bad uh, as like a as like a product to sell. So like lots of companies now are dropping support for it, and that used to be their sort of connector ecosystem. That was what they were selling to connect to other um, tools, and it's difficult to justify how costly it is to maintain and run um, for these businesses. So the, the sort of Kafka ecosystem, you, I used to have no presence there. 
Um, mm. And I don't really have the resources to kind of like reach out because it's very, it's very established, very corporate, lots of consultants kind of dictating and thought leaders who, you know, they're, they're obviously very much tied to the JVM space. So I kind of carved out my own space and I wasn't really privy to any of that stuff. But in the last year or so, I think because there seems to be this sort of collapse in trust on Kafka Connect, um, which I think is a bit, it, it's a bit over the top. Kafka Connect is, is obviously fun for a lot of things. I think it's just difficult to, to justify um, mm-hmm. for some of these companies. Uh, they're obviously looking at other tools and obviously Benthos fits that bill really well. And there's, there's a lot of crossover. Obviously there's lots of stuff that Kafka Connect, Connect does that Benthos doesn't. Um, but there's, there's enough overlap there that you can kind of productize it. So a lot of these companies were seeing it at the same time and they're all, they're all kind of like dabbling with it. So, um, Warpstream can, you know, they're, they're, they're playing around with the idea of running Benthos configs in their product. And I, th- I think it's scary because they're obviously like serious competitors. So they, they obviously knew that, um, some sort of deal was happening, uh, just because of all the signs. Uh, it was mm-hmm. pretty obvious. So I think they, they kind of had it queued up, ready to go. Cause I mean, they, they announced that like the day after. Yeah. So the day after the, the acquisition was public, they're on Hacker News talking about their fork. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not anti fork. We, I've specifically structured the repos right now to, enable people to have forks of the connectors. Mm -hmm. Um, And the beauty of it is there's an MIT licensed core engine. And if you fork all the connectors and put whatever license you want on it and support it however you want, it will compile with that engine and other people can pull components from either. So they, they could mix and match any vendor's connectors. That was always the plan from, from the technical perspective. But what they've chosen to do is do like a monolithic fork of the whole thing. So they, they have a monolithic repo right now, which is just everything in one mm-hmm. thing, which isn't decentralized. So, I mean, I'm not sure what their plan is. Um, but right now, basically, my main gripe is that that's not good for the community. Because obviously, if the whole point of this fork is, is for the community anti-Red Panda, um, then you know at least make it decentralized so people can share plugins because right mm-hmm. now they can't share plugins between the two forks. But that's mm-hmm. there's no there's no technical reason why that couldn't be the case, and it would rely on MIT licensed code. So there's not really any reason for it other than just where. I think the we had a Ohad on the show from N Zero, and I think from sort of the other side of the of the fork, right? They N uh, Zero and some other companies uh, were the people who forked uh, Terraform into uh, Open Tofu. Now, this is obviously not the same because uh, Terraform was monolithically open source and then monolithically source available. And this is a lot more open source than that. Like Red Panda Connect is a lot more open source than uh, a Terraform is right now, for sure. But I think that the reaction um, makes sense on both sides and it, it, I think it does hurt the community in the short term, these sorts of decisions, even open tofu and, and Terraform. It's like, ah, we had all these people working on this beautiful thing together and now they're separated. Yeah. But I think like it with open tofu, we're seeing, uh, you know, in a few, we still need to let it cook for like a year or two until we finally th- see the results. But overall, I think it sort of stresses out uh, the core developers, like the actual people, like you said, in the gnarly bits to make sure that their side of the fork is really good. It's basically competition one on one. Yeah, right? competition. It's and in the long term, it's not like these two projects are gonna live side by side for 15 years now. And you know, we're we're gonna invest a ton of time into both of them. It's gonna get lost. It's not it's not a case, right? Um, so I think I sort of agree with you that it's kind of mad just because I saw the uh announcement, I was happy for you, then I read the blog post, like, oh no. <laughs> is Ash a shill for has he been a shill for Red Panda for the last 10 years even though Red Panda has only been out for six like but I, I overall I really hope that this will end up being they do a fork and the Red Panda Connect project ends up being slightly better for it you know as an educational experience and I hope uh, both companies end up succeeding in their own niche yeah exactly it's, it's difficult because it's like you've got the competition side the fragmenting of the sort of ecosystem around it was probably going to happen anyway, because I think that there was like what I predicted was going to happen was people who are just they, they cannot tolerate uh, a company running a project, um, especially one that has to make money and is mm-hmm. part of the capitalist system. So it's like they, they have a, a problem with that. And, you know, I, I was expecting people to have kind of like community forks. 
um, and they're they're kind of there to keep the project honest. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like it's not really that we're going to diverge. We're not going to do a bunch of changes that means we've completely diverged from your other project. But it's more just we're going to keep this thing here, and it's going to be known in the community as like you know the the project X. Like it's just some extra thing that people are aware of. And the idea is that if Red Panda ever became bad stewards, then this is the thing that people could just flock to. Whereas because there's there's a big competition aspect between these two companies, I think it's 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 a bit sad that they're kind of like they're the only dominating forces right now in the forks space. I was kind of hoping it would be a community fork that made technical sense uh, rather than kind of like a panic fork. <laughs> like it it does feel a little bit like it was like a panic maneuver. Um, that's not necessarily well thought through. But I mean, they've got like, like it, it's obviously the first week. It's the first week of the acquisition, but it's also the first week of their fork. So I mean, they might they might change things so that there is more um, shared code base. But I, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to, to expect at this point. They might not knock you out of the park with features. <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> well, yeah. Like obviously, I can I can just keep slapping on features and pull requests and stuff, which is obviously the intention anyway. Um, but the the thing I would personally be scared of um as the you know this is kind of like my baby is is the idea of just willy-nilly stripping out stuff from the engine in the name of you know like benchmark numbers and just rolling out features from like a competitive standpoint and basically racing to the bottom of you you're mm-hmm. essentially eliminating guarantees because there's there's stuff in the benthos engine that i know is critical for the 2am pages so, like the delivery guarantees that Benthos has is completely unnecessary for a product that you're putting out there and giving to people. Because if you have weak delivery guarantees, well, you're just one of many products that people run that have weak delivery guarantees where the user won't realize because it's not, you know, it's a one in a three year event where you'll be hit by that stuff. And obviously, the core engine of Benthos is specifically designed to be the one that doesn't have that. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a technical decision. It's very, very difficult to, to get that balance right between, mm-hmm. you know, back pressures, delivery guarantees, speed, uh, scaling, all that kind of stuff. So my worry is, um, you know, fork city happens. Everybody's got a fork. They're all stripping the engine out in weird, incompatible ways. And then we end up with this, like, like race to the bottom. Because that, that's what Benthos wasn't. Like, Benthos wasn't the tool that was kind of pressured to uh, sacrifice those things in the name of, you know, delivering all these things. I'm optimistic because I don't think the engine really needs to change that much. It's quite stable now, but that does that does worry me. But you know, I'll just leave and <laughs> you know, ten, <laughs> ten years on, I'll just be doing something else, won't I? So I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping to make myself uh, unnecessary in the project anyway. So yeah, right. Maybe it'll work out. So Ash, you're actually the first repeat interviewee that we have. Uh, that's going to get both questions, uh, stumper questions. Uh, last year, our stumper question was, uh, what feature would you reap out from Go and what uh, feature would you steal from another language? Uh, when we ended up with a full feature list on both columns, we were like, okay, we need to rephrase this. And I'm actually interested to know when you started learning Go, uh, what was difficult or surprising for you? Uh, Go was your f- wasn't your first language, right? No, so I was, um, I was a C++ kid. Uh, did a bit of C sharp and then went back to C plus plus and then go and that was pretty much it from that point onwards. I, it was about I think it was about 2016. No, it was actually it must have been only no, it was probably 2014, maybe mm-hmm. 2013. I started using Go. Uh, you can look at because so that library I've got Tunny. That's pretty much I made that immediately when I started learning Go because the one of the first things I noticed was hang on a minute, how is there no thread pool? Like how is there no Go routine pool here? Because I was just expecting that in the standard library, and I was very surprised, so I made one. And it wasn't until I made it that I realized, oh, actually, this is very unnecessary. Because you know, mm-hmm. with, with channels and go routines, it's not it's it's not difficult to re-implement that when you need it, mm-hmm. and you normally you know you normally want to re-implement it. First commit March twenty third, twenty fifteen, but the copyright is twenty fourteen. That's probably I probably. Um, Copied it I probably over re- from somewhere else. Rebased it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 2014 is probably about maybe the end of 2014. Let's find this out. We need this right now. Um, <laughs> this is not. This the... is not that good of a code, I have to say. Uh, first, commit, <laughs> first commit from 2015. Whoa! So uh, when you came into Go, uh, what was like difficult for you to to grok and, and wrap your head around? 
or maybe what was surprising for you? The thing I didn't like was uh, lack of some slash enum slash union types, whatever people want. To, like depending on your language is what you'll know it has. But it was it was that because. Um, I wanted to do JSON parsing, and I found it really weird that it it has to pull things out into you know generic maps and generic arrays rather than mm-hmm. like a sum type where you can make it more explicit because that's just what I was used to. And then I found it really weird that like if you've got a generic map, why is there no syntax for just walking it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, that blew my mind because it's like this seems like everybody's going to hit this right. Everybody's going to have a JSON API. Everyone's going to have like a poorly defined uh, structure. Because that, that was my world. I, I just assumed everybody had that problem. Um, so I was, I was shocked and devastated when I found out there's no like, there's nothing there to kind of help you with that. But obviously, like I discovered, you could just, you know, you can just slap a library together. It's not, it's not a big deal. You can just do that yourself. Just get, get it, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Yeah. Make yourself a library for it. Um, Write another for loop. Generics. I think a lot of that's finally coming in 1.23. Yeah, if you're no, uh, the that. new Ash uh, joining, you know, to go right now, 10 years later, uh, you'll get the Range Rover Funk and all this uh, generics nonsense. And you yeah. can build <laughs> Generics <up>. nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Russ, Russ needs to keep himself busy somehow, you know. <laughs> you need another connector on top of your 220 connectors and Russ needs a Seek 3 iteration. Um, I'm moving on cool. to Zig. There we go. That'll solve all the problems. Yeah. Ash, thanks all for coming, man. Uh, again. Thanks for and, taking our call. Yeah, for taking our call. Never again. Uh, not on this again. number. I'll, I'll burn this phone after we hang up. I've only had this sim for a week. <laughs> <laughs> again, I really want to congratulate you on this. Uh, you know, we can dive into the technical details and, and what happened, what's going to happen, whatever. But I think a congratulation is in order. You mentioned Thank somewhere you. during this interview an end of a journey, and I really, really feel uh, this marks a big uh, stone in your journey. I don't know if it's the end of it, but it's a really, really cool one. And I think it's yeah. a really big success story for open source and people who work on open source and, you know, have some sponsors and, and are thinking about long-term what they can do, can really look into your just tireless work on this pro- well i don't know if tireless but very i was relentless. very lazy at times yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean like relentless dude working on the same project with the same uh tone for many many years uh and having just this recognition by the way both the fork people and red, De- red panda people and just random people on hacker news every nobody's like yeah but maybe the engine's not good Every no ash's code is pretty great right <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the logo is good everybody unanimously loves the logo yeah, yeah. for sure uh, more so, so than the engine well I, it's less gnarly you know what i mean <laughs> it's cuter <laughs> uh so we just really want to congratulate you man uh well thank really you for cool. having me on it's been great we'll do it again maybe next time you solve a business yeah next uh, next <laughs> hey, acquisition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you. I think I'm done. (laughs) All right. Thanks a lot, Ash.